Hey, Trevor Matthews here from Refrigeration Mentor, and I'm at the inspection lab with Tibor, who is the customer service specialist who gets the funnest job in the world by inspecting, looking at so many different compressors and analyzing what we do as technicians in the field. And we're gonna walk through some of the mechanical failures that you may come across in the field. And this is why it's so important to understand how a compressor runs, and the different situations you may encounter when you're in the field working on it. Tibor, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Awesome. Do you want to give a little introduction on who you are and what you do? Yes, I'm the customer service specialist, but I'm also specialized in the analysis as we are on our table of inspection and repair for a broken compressor because it can happen. <laughs> yeah. We have just uh, some components, but uh, we are uh, going to explain some yeah. cases of yeah, mechanical exactly. failure. Exactly, so one of the ones that happens a lot is a flooded start situation. And flooded starts is really when the compressor's off and maybe your crankcase heater is not working and it's off for a long period of time and the refrigerant migrates its way back to the compressor. What are some of the telltale signs for flooded starts? Yeah, the flooded start uh, can have some unexpected refrigerant in liquid phase here. Here, our design expects to have just oil. Yeah. But sometimes, uh, after long uh, off period, as uh, just told, the refrigerant can move and yeah. arrive here. If you have a mixture of oil and liquid refrigerant inside the crankcase, we have not the best mixture at all to guarantee the lubrication of the wall compressor that inside the shaft we distribute the oil. This is the main part of the circuit of lubrication of the compressor. So all of a sudden the compressor is off, you look in the sight glass, sometimes that sight glass is full. It's like, is that oil or is that liquid refrigerant? Because too much oil is no good in a compressor, but uh, when I've seen uh, compressors full of liquid refrigerant, all of a sudden this looks like a full yeah. sight glass. Yeah, you can see just a level, but you don't know what is the cocktail inside. Yeah, yeah. And so when that compressor starts up, the first thing you're gonna see in this is a, like a massive explosion of foam, right? Yeah, massive explosion. That's the correct way, way to say because the, the foam is really white, really yeah. big, really persistent, and uh, last for uh, also a couple of minutes or yeah. three minutes, and you have to... You gotta worry about that, right? So you, you must be worried because uh, you are in, in a critical situation that must be solved very soon, otherwise a sudden seizure can, uh, can happen. So you have that massive explosion. So one thing, it could be you have that liquid refrigerant washing the oil away from different parts, but after that, just say that after the, that explosion, you start to see the foam start to start to drop in the compressor. What is actually happening inside the compressor when you see that foam dropping? When the foam drops, you are normalizing the situation here in the crankcase. But you have to consider that in the meantime, how many how many turns the <laughs> shaft already already have done, and what does it mean? Many turns of the shaft. The shaft is here. There is a splashing disc. The splashing disc can elevate uh, a spray of oil. In this case, don't uh, forget, we are uh, considering oil mixed to the liquid, liquid refrigerant. Yeah. So it's like a poison for the compressor. Yeah. The splashing disc can elevate the spray till here. You can see the yeah. oil inside the pocket. So now instead of just oil, you got a mixture of oil and refrigerant. Yeah, when you enter the shaft, the oil cannot boil anymore because it's restricted in a small volume. Yep. And this oil is not a lubricant. It's totally yeah. the opposite. The cleaner. It's a cleaner, <laughs> it's a cleaner. And what we do? We bring the cleaner here directly on the big end of the cone rods. Here, directly. On the, on the main bearings of the compressor. This is usually the first components that fail because 
is uh, subjected to a very big mechanical stress because it's the central uh, base yep. of the wall uh, crank mechanism. And uh, if you put there not the oil, but the poison, we are going encountering very, very soon the seizure of the, of the compressor. Yeah, and so when that seizes up, really when a technician comes there, the compressor seizes, so when the, they turn the power back on, it could trip the breaker, you hit lock rotor amps. Lock rotor. You got your amp clamp on and you look on the side of the compressor and it's gonna say your LRA or your lock rotor amps, yeah. and it's gonna give you that number and it trips off. That could be one situation that... This uh, surface become very hot, yep. no refrigerant effect, no flow, tripping of the breakers. And so what are a couple of preventions of flooded starts? Flooded start is first of all prevented and tackled by using the crankcase heater. Crankcase heater, yes. Yeah, we have it. On this side right here. So you want to check that. You want to take your meter and check the resistance. Make sure you got power coming to that. Make sure it's a, the auxiliary on the contact is working, things like that. What else could you a, check? A current mass flow. Yeah. You, you can see with the, with the clamp yep. by, for measuring the uh, amperage on the panel. You can have some indication, some yep. lead. Exactly. And uh, otherwise, uh, if you are um, an old school uh, technician, you can just Touch put the it. hand yeah, yeah, yeah. and feel the warm yeah, yeah. on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes also the crankcase heater cannot enough to yeah. prevent a big migration of refrigerant yeah. because sometimes some application can have long, long periods of maybe yeah. during the transport of the unit. Yeah. So uh, in that case, we simply suggest to close the valve. So make the, the oil totally away from any return oh, of... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so simple, yeah. but uh, ma many times it's not simply not considered to make this simple prevention. Isolate the compressor, drain out the contaminated oil or saturate it, I guess, to saturate it with liquid oil. Uh, another one, though, is in refrigeration application, pump down applications. Yeah, pump down, uh, simply remove the most of the quantity of the refrigerant inside this volume. And what happens? Simply the refrigerant stay just in the vapor phase. Yeah. Vapor phase means uh, not enough uh, mass of refrigerant that can be able to dissolve, to mix, mix up yeah. with the oil. So we are uh, in, a, in a very safe condition if we provide a pump down during the off period of the compressor. Yeah. So these are a few of the things for flooded starts. Now, okay, we just talked about flooded starts. What happens if you have like a massive flood of start? Like this compressor is full right up to here with uh, liquid refrigerant. So you got way much and then the compressor starts up. What could you see at that point? Okay. We will see for sure uh, a total destruction of the compressor. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, but the probable, uh, the, the most like end will be the suction of droplet of liquid refrigerant directly on the internal conduits here, this okay. way, on the upper side, this way, ending here. And if we bring liquid droplets just to the suction port of our valve plates, we will face for sure liquid slug inside the compressor chamber with the smashing of the suction reed valves. So that there you would the call... You would call that floodback now. So the compressor at this point is running because this is not the way I talk about ah, floodback. So this is so this is good. So now this compressor is running, and just say your metering device, your TX valve, it fails open. You get a piece of copper jammed in it, and all of a sudden you're satisfied, but you got a ton of liquid coming down that suction line. This would be another way to get a, a liquid hammer, a slug, where that, like you just explained, it goes through here, the liquid comes up here, and then. We have the smash, yes. Awesome. This example you made is uh, more extreme. Yeah. So when uh, another components fail and let all the pipe section free for the liquid return, yeah. you, we, we can suffer this kind of uh, damage. So what happens with floodback, but it's only minor? 
So we, we have liquid, so it's not boiling off. It's making its way back. It doesn't make its way up through here, but we still have flood back. What, what's the sort of things you start to see uh, at that point? My opinion, a minor flood back is a very sneaky yeah. problem because it's uh, like quite invisible. It's, uh, we must uh, return to the first uh, case we explained. And we, again, we have a return from the suction yep. of the liquid in droplets that maybe has no enough velocity to rise yep. till this quote, but simply ends in the lower part uh, underneath the motor. And over there we, ha we have the uh, equalization valve for oil. And on the other side, just by flipping the compressor, we are again inside the crankcase and we can assume to be in the same case of the first one we explained and again a little bit of foam a displacement of the poisoned oil inside the pocket inside the lubrication circuit and again here on the big end of the con rod or inside the main bashing of the compressor so you just we just talked about seeing bubbles inside here two different ways so if it starts up and you see a bunch of bubbles, that's flooded start. But if it starts up and the oil level's normal, you got normal oil, that's fine. But all of a sudden you start to see foaming and you start to see foaming in the sight glass, that is flood back happening. So that's two different telltale signs if it's a, a flood between a flood at start and a flood back. Did you say yeah. so? It will be different. Uh, just the experience can bring a good technician to be able to make the difference. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. Uh, and understand the real, uh, what's, it's real ongoing inside the system. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about when you have a damaged valve plate. And there's two different ways to look at it. Cause for me, I'm always talking to technician, if the compressor's not pumping properly, you need to look inside the compressor cause you don't know what happened, right? Yeah. And if you don't know what happened, how can you make sure that new compressor you put in is safe, right? So let's talk a little bit about a valve plate and if you have valve plate damage. Okay. We have a generic valve plate, very common design. It is the upper side. We can observe discharge valve with the stopper on the opposite side. We have completed the kit with its own gasket and we can observe the suction reed valve. So let's make an example of the direction of the flow. We are coming from the suction mm -hmm. from the body. We go from yeah through this hole yeah from top to the bottom we enter like this the valve opens we are in the compression chamber yeah. and again outside of the discharge valve and in here for going to, to be delivered to the to the plant usually we can suffer uh, two kind of breakage or the discharge reed valves or the suction reed valves. It can make a very big difference yeah. because suction reed valves, they leave inside the compressor so in chamber here, in here. You get damage here, you get damage on here because you're yeah. just compressing the, the suction reeds. If uh, we lose a piece, a part of the suction reed valve, we for sure will hammer this debris on the, on the valve plate and on the other side, on the ceiling of the piston. So generally a breakage of this small piece requires 100% of the cases, the replacement of the pistons also, not just the valve plate that is yeah. so easy to dismount and mount back again, but not the same for the piston because we have to remove the shaft to uh, keep off the con rod, yep. disassemble the con rod from the pistons yep. and uh, then back again. The other case... And, the, and that would happen from a uh, massive flood back, which we talked about. We have... The massive flow back simply, it's uh, an unexpected, not compressible media yeah. inside the compressor chamber. So the, the very little gap, uh, the, the clearance volume, yeah. We, we design with our technicians in the yeah. uh, technical office. Uh, it's no more there because it's totally filled by 
the incompressible film yeah. of liquid and we, we are uh, striking a punch yeah. directly to the red valves and uh, we then go face the breakage and the hammering of the debris between these two yeah. surfaces. So all of these components must be changed and replaced. Yeah. So that was liquid. Could oil do the same thing? Could you get oil up in there? Yeah. And how does the oil get liquid, up in there? Liquid is liquid. Yeah. So if it's a refrigerant liquid or oil, it's the same. You strike a punch to these valves and it's a non-compressible media. Yes. Compressor can compress just vapor and gases. Okay, so I do have a question for you. Just say you have a low temp application and in the evaporator starts to log a lot of oil from the system. And then all of a sudden you have a defrost and then all that oil comes back. Could that be a potential to smash the valves coming from the suction line and you got all this oil entrained in the, uh, the gas? Every sudden event and uh, big transient can bring to liquid return inside the compression chamber yeah. can be an example. Okay, cool. So that was, that is smashing the suction valve. So that could be some examples of breaking that. What about the discharge ones? The discharge valve can break for um, many reasons. For example, thermal fatigue. If you reach uncontrolled high temperature and back to low temperature, maybe you have uh, a liquid injection, but you didn't set up yeah. the timing. Yeah. The PID control is not... Yeah. Uh, very good, you can face like yep. this diagram of temperature stressing the discharge valve yep. that is designed for thermal and mechanical stress, but not for yes. very big yeah, thermal exactly. stress. Yeah, so yeah. this is just one example. What happens? It can break like this. The backing and the valve, yeah. And this is a much different situation like before, because we have just a shortcut to exit the compressor. So the broken part, the, bo the broken debris of the discharge valve simply come here, come here underneath the discharge valve and oh. goes to the circuit on the discharge pipeline. If you have uh, just a filter, yep. okay, his trip is already yeah, yeah. ended and yep. finished and we, we don't suffer any big damage neither for the compressor, neither for the implantation. You can simply make uh, a simple repair on the field and dismount the head, dismount yeah. the valve plate, replace with uh, a new one. Go. And the compressor, in most of the cases, can restart again with no problems. Yeah, so fantastic. So, so that's a few things, right? So if you do get a situation where you do break this, could be from a slug, potential slog, could be from thermal stress that breaks this, what about while this is on there, just say it's a long period of time that this is broken. Now I know that I got discharge gas pushing down yeah, onto yeah, the yeah. piston. What could do that do? As usual, the soonest you detect a problem, you will face a better situation, mechanical situation of the entire compressor. So if you are in uh, this case, the damage was prolonged and you, for example, lost just one, piston and all the three other pistons are working well. So maybe you cannot immediately understand that your uh, cooling capacity is reduced by the one quarter. Yeah. Well, if you're uh, on a parallel rack, you could have six compressors, rack, right? So in all the situation, easy to detect. Yes. But if you don't detect in a reasonable time, what happens? You open the port here, you have the HP, so the high pressure, that insist on the sealing of the piston all the time, when it is up, when it is down, yeah. and again and again. Usually, the piston faces an average pressure between the lowest and the highest pressure in the system. If you let this piston working facing the highest pressure all the time, you will stress on his pin and can uh, arise a very accelerated wearing and your gaps, your tolerances going bigger and bigger. Yeah, yeah. And uh, at a certain moment, some uh, main mechanical failure will come. Yeah, yeah. and so that, that would be like, here's the wrist pin. This, 
This connects, this actually goes in here. Oh, so actually this goes in here like this, just so everyone knows. And then this goes in there and that's how it holds on to the, to the rod. Okay, so, that, so that, that's good to know if you have a broken discharge that you can change this in the field. So, but you need a look, you need an inspection. Properly pump it down, properly isolate, get the refrigerant out, properly electrically isolate the compressor so it cannot start. And then you take it apart and look inside. What about, uh, you have a lot of overheat, high pressure ratio, compression ratio, you got a high, high super, you come back, you lost gas. What is the valve plate gonna look like at that point? This uh, valve plate in my end is quite uh, clean. Oh, quite yeah. clean. It's not uh, brand new, but it's quite clean. How should it look if an overheat will be suffered? It will already be, have been suffered. This part, the discharge part, can be brown. Brown or black. Uh, usually, if you don't have any uh, coccalization of oil, yep. you just see it uh, brown. Okay. The, really like cooked. It's a yeah. cooked. Uh, yeah, cooked uh, cooked valve plate. Yep. Depending on the magnitude of this overheating, you can also observe some irradiation, yep. some uh, spreading of this, uh, this browning. Yep. Also, be beyond the discharge. Yeah, so it's moving to the suction. And, and back, move into the suction. Yes, yep. perfect. So what would you see inside for these, so overheating, it's pretty easy. If you take this, like I can wipe this off. So, you know, it's not bad at all, but if you can't wipe that off, that is cooked on there, like yeah, you yeah. said. So that's really bad overheat. What would it look like inside the cylinders? Cause inside these cylinders, they're always like, they're honed and you have a, um, a rings here. So you keep the oil inside there. Mm. What happens if I look inside here and there's a lot of scarring up and down? What could that, what could cause that? If the uh, overheating, uh, is prolonged and the temperature are not controlled, so you are working outside the uh, recommended envelope, you can reach the situation where dilatation. Dilatation, I never the, heard that, so seize it. So the dilatation the, yeah. um, of the, the geometry of this piston increases too much mm -hmm. and there is no more any gap yep. and really- Wears, wears, yeah, yeah, wears. Wears uh, and scratches uh, yeah. all the 360 circumference. Yep. So uh, this is the, uh, the last step because sooner or later, the piston totally blocks inside the, the cylinder and the compressor will never start again. Yeah. Okay, maybe it uh, will be able to restart after a cool down, but uh, not, not for a long period because yeah. uh, the, the seizure and the damage is already too big yeah. to be able to go on. Because if you do have overheating, so it could be high compression ratio, high return gas temperature coming back. You, if you don't have insulation in your suction line, that's really bad. You're gonna make sure you have insulation in your suction line. If you get wear in here, what also could happen is blow by. So every time that compresses up and you have scarring here and these, these rings are not stopping any of the oil because the oil is a sealant as well, that discharge will be pushing down here, overheating the inside of the compressor. So. These are some telltale signs if you uh, have an overheating compressor. So that's awesome, that is awesome. So what are some of the things that could cause electrical failures? Because we're talking about mechanical failures and a lot of these mechanical failures can lead to an electrical failure. Because if we have a smashed, say a, some smashed suction, that could make its way back into the stator and cause a short. Yeah, it, it can happen, it can, it can happen. One uh, good example is again, the breakage, uh, the breakage of the suction reed valve. If you break a suction reed valve, where are located the yeah. debris? Are here, just here, just near to this hole, just near to this channel. And yeah. what, what we have yeah. at the end of this channel? <laughs> the motor, yeah, the, yeah. the stator and the windings. Yeah. So if uh, metallic debris can uh, reach the windings, can uh, start to hammer yeah. where? Uh, inside the turbulences. Yeah can hammer a little bit, a little bit, uh, they can uh, be able to wear the insulation, the wires on the wings, and uh, you can suffer both grounding yep. and uh, short circuit. Sure. It is uh, a, a, a real example of yeah. what can happen so backwards to the, to the motor, 
yeah. to cause the fail to cause the, the electrical fail. Yeah. So what you need to do is you need to take your meter once again, isolate the compressor, make sure it's off. Take your meter and check the resistance. And so if that is a, a, a grounded compressor, you'd be on one of the legs, you put it to the compressor, a grounding point. Yeah. And if that's a dead short, it could be from one, a, a, a mechanical failure. Because a lot of times I see people say, oh, it's electrical failure, but it was caused by a mechanical failure. And if you don't fix that mechanical failure, that's gonna lead to another failed compressor. Sure. It is better all the time to stream down all the compressor to stay on a comfortable table yeah. and look uh, at any point because one failure can affect another component that yeah. you don't consider by first, but in the end, yeah. uh, this is the story. We don't always have the luxury of putting on a table to do it like we have here, but if that compressor fails and you can't work it, take it back to your shop, look at it, inspect it if you can, because that's how you learn, that's how you grow. Let's talk about a few electrical failures because I know electrical is one, was one of the hardest things for me. You know, it still is like reading electrical diagrams, but what are a few of the electrical failures that could cause a compressor to fail? Electrical failure can be generated by uh, external causes. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the um, electrical cabinet can have some fails. For example, if you lose one phase supplying the compressor, the compressor start to move uh, not smoothly, yeah. but uh, one leg one leg is missing. So two le two leg pushes exactly. one leg is not working. Yeah. So start to make the compressor vibrating. And uh, most important is that the just two phases are not able to withstand the the load the mechanical load. So in the end, these two working phasing will be overloaded and overheat. Overheat, yeah. And then you you encounter some electrical failure. Yeah, so then you're gonna have a lot of overheat. So one, one instance could be that your contactor, you have pitting on one phase of your contactor and that is not making. So the contactor's not making, two of the legs are making, one is not. Yeah. And then you're causing overheat, overload, which will lead to uh, actually a motor, compressor motor failure. Yeah. Again, if you want to mix up a little bit and uh, make it, try to confuse uh, our friends, you are running with two phases, the compressor is vibrating, the compressor is mechanically destroyed. No, no. Simply, you have an uh, electrical failure and you are convinced that it's mechanical. So until you have the compressor open- yeah, Inspecting it. And ins inspected, you, you cannot uh, state anything uh, for sure. Yeah. And so it could be a contactor, it could be a blown fuse for some reason. You have a bunch of refrigerant in there and it starts up and the it, it, overlocked rotor potentially blows one fuse and not all, all three and that could lead to a single phase and potentially there's a lots of other things that it could be. What are a few other electrical failures that could happen? And sometimes most of the motor, most of the stator can be connected above 400 volts and 230. Yeah. But technicians that make the installation must know how to mount the uh, jumpers. Yes. Because sometimes a brand new compressor <laughs> was back to that gate. Yeah. What's happened? Oh, I forgot to uh, change Jeez. the configuration of my jumpers and I immedi immediately uh, burn out uh, my motor. So yeah. uh, it is a procedure error yeah. on the commissioning that in some cases, uh, it happens, it, expert technicians there are on the fields, but youngsters are coming and yeah. they must understand, they must learn, and they yeah. must experience. make some experience, make some mistakes. It's, uh, I've done it. It's so not. that's a bit, big thing is, is that if you have a dual voltage motor, not all compressors are dual voltage, but if you have a dual voltage, you, will, you may have jumpers. So that, that's a good example if you have a 4, 460 supply, these are US voltage, you have a 460 supply, but you have it jumper for 230 and then you put 460 game over for that winding yeah. now if you have it wired for 460 and you're only putting 230 to it your compressor is probably not going to start up it doesn't have enough power to start up you're going to how come it's not starting how come it's not starting oh it's a, a doa compressor the dead on arrival people call it it yeah, doesn't yeah, yeah. but really it's not the jumpers aren't on, right? So just verify that they are, and all the time that you have the wiring diagrams, you get it in your documentations. Okay, fantastic. Okay, we're gonna talk about 
when you do replace a valve plate because it happens, you have that smash discharge valve and you need to do a replacement. What is the process? I know that you're gonna have to put some gaskets on and then you're gonna have to put some bolt, the bolts back in, but what is your process to properly replace a valve plate? The process is to go step by step from the bottom to the top and see the shape of the gasket and be sure that it matches okay, with yeah. this, this uh, perimeter. Yep. And uh, then you put the valve plate. The valve plate usually have these pins. You can have four or eight pins that can be inserted in the proper little oh, holes. Yep. So you have with the end, uh, be sure that you are reaching plane on plane coupling because you have centered the pin with the holes. Yep. And then again, you have another gasket upside the valve plates. And again, you have to match. For example, we have one central screw, yep. one central screw. The one central screw must couple like this. Okay. Otherwise, you can check HP and LP. HP is the, on the same side of the discharge uh, rid valves yep. with, the, with their stoppers. So, in the end, you put the head, you be sure that you are centering every hole with yep. every threaded hole, and then uh, can help uh, with uh, two sticks to, yep. to center yep. all, the, all the kit, all the assemble, and then in the end, you put all the, all the screws and torque it to the recommended torque value. Every dimension, so it's a small head, it requires M8 screws. This is the biggest compressor, it requires 14 M10 screws, and uh, every size of the screw requires a recommended, uh, for example, from M8 to M10, more or less there is the double torque required for a good uh, uh, tightening because we must guarantee the sealing line here. Yeah. First thing, so when I put on a gasket, I've always put the oil of clean oil on the gasket. Do you recommend yeah. that? Yeah, it's a good practice. It works on the paper gasket. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, in the refrigeration technology, many times you can find also metallic yeah. gaskets. Metallic gaskets already have a coating. Coating on it. A coating that's like a, like a, a gum, yeah, yeah. a sealing, a gum. So in that case, you don't need, okay. you don't have any advantage to put some drop of oil, but yep. for the gasket made like paper, yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's very yeah. recommended, just awesome. a, a very small yeah. amount and small drops you don't need to reach the situation when, where you yeah, can you squeeze, it in. Yeah, yeah. You you can squeeze it. Your, uh, your gasket yeah, yeah. from the oil because it is uh, too much, but uh, a little... Yeah. Uh, so put a little bit of oil, clean oil that's gonna be oil. in the, the compressor, if yeah. it's PoE 32, you put that on there, then you put it on, you put your valve plate on, then you put your top gasket and then your head on it. So the other thing that we said is the torque value. 100% every time you need to go into the documentation, unless you remember, I don't remember the torque value, and you gotta go in and match it up. So M8 bolts, like, like we talked about, is gonna be different than M10. So I talk about inch pounds, and then you talk about Newton, Newton per, meter, per meter. Newton per meter, it doesn't matter what the units are. You wanna make sure you torque them properly. And when, you, when I do it, I usually put one in here uh, and uh, level it, like, just like you said, one in here, and then a bunch of them in here. But I don't go and just start screwing them all around. I don't just take one and uh, screw it all in. I'll, I'll do a star pattern. Star pattern, okay, perfect. Yeah, so That's you go from, from here to 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 here. Whatever, whatever your star pattern, just like a tire you're putting on your car, it's a star pattern. After, uh, what I do is I take my torque wrench and then I just go around and verify it is the exact torque once again, just because it'll click every time. So you have the proper torque because what I've seen and what I've done in the past is I did not use a torque wrench and I just tighten them down 
way more than it should be. And that's where leaks can happen. You think tighten it down more is better, but it's not because you could squish that gasket and then over time as the compressor shakes, as it runs, you could cause more of a leak, more damage. Or on a Friday afternoon, you tighten it down and you break the bolt, which is terrible. And I've done that too. So these are a few terrible. tips when you're changing a, a valve plate. Tibor, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to, to walk thank me through friend. some of this stuff because this is important. You really want to look at a, the compressor as a different way because this is the heart of the system. This is what makes the plants run and this is what keeps your system running for a long, long time. Once again, I want to thank you so much. Thank you, Tibor. And I'll see you at the next Refrigeration Mentor video. Bye-bye.